you're about to enter into a new world of knowledge, curiosities, and high strangeness. This is a podcast of Straight Up Strange Productions. You're listening to Mysteries and Monsters. I'm your host, Paul Bestel. The history surrounding the Druids is still shrouded in mystery, but thankfully my guest this week will try to enlighten us all. Ellen Evert Hoppen is one of the most well-known mages and Druids in the modern world, with over 40 years of experience. As an author of numerous books, Ellen has assisted bringing Druidry back from the fringes as its presence in the modern world continues to grow. But before that, don't forget you can support Mysteries and Monsters by signing up at patreon.com slash mysteriesandmonsters. $4 a month gets you ad-free episodes, guaranteed early releases, bonus content, and more. You can also click the link in the show notes as usual. Mysteries and Monsters is across all social media platforms. Please subscribe to our channel on YouTube. You can also visit mysteriesandmonsters.com for news and episodes. Our exclusive merchandise site is available for t-shirts, mugs, stickers and more, all through TeePublic, and the link is also in the show notes. Our intro and outro music are provided by the marvellous Weary Pines. Thank you as always to Dean Bestall for his wonderful artwork. The show is produced by Brennan Storr of the Ghost Story Guys, and Mysteries and Monsters is delighted to be a part of the Straight Up Strange Network. The gateway to the druid world awaits us, as we join my guest, Ellen Everett Hopman. Today we delve into the world of the Druid and the company of Ellen Everett Hopman. Ellen has been a Druidic initiative since 1984 and is a master herbalist and lay homeopath and a member of the Grey Council of Majors and Sages. In her new book, Celtic Druidry, Rituals, Techniques and Magical Practices, Ellen offers the pathway to become a modern druid. Ellen, I'm delighted to welcome you to Mysteries and Monsters. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. It's really wonderful to talk to somebody over in Britain. I'm in Massachusetts uh, in the U.S., so <laughs> speaking across the Atlantic. Absolutely. It shows you the the breadth and length that information and subjects can travel these days Alan it's remarkable often a lot of the people I speak to are usually based in North America so for me I never thought I'd be so comfortable knowing every time zone in North America but here we are <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's high summer here and um, it's been a very hot summer and um, I understand that it's hot where you are now so that's the new world. <laughs> it is. It is. I have, I've had my, my sun cream at hand for most of the last few weeks, Alan, but we have to take care of ourselves when we get to a certain vintage, I feel. Oh, yeah. And wear a hat. <laughs> yes. Yes, I have to wear a hat. Yes. Unfortunately, my hair decided to, to shuffle off this mortal coil many a year ago. <laughs> when I was reading your introduction into the into the new book, as I mentioned in the introduction, The Celtic Druidry, um, there was a lovely line where you kind of made me chuckle in regards to the fact that often the portrayal of druids in media and certain concepts, perhaps, is that they're nothing more than simple tree huggers, Ellen, um, which which brought a smile to my face. Because I think these the term druid in the modern era, depending on where you come from and, and what you've practiced, I think unless you're involved in the actual druid circles around the world there is this kind of modern interpretation of druids that they're always sort of shown as strange old men living in the woods and this seems to be one of those things once again that we can lay at the door of the victorians for completely changing mm -hmm. what people think about things that's right <laughs> yeah i mean that I've been doing research, obviously, for many years, and I even have an essay called Female Druids, which if you Google my name, Ellen Everett Hopman, and Female Druids, the article will come up. Um, it's available. And it was not hard to find evidence for female druids. There's plenty of evidence. A lot of the people that were negotiating contracts were female druids, or the seers were female druids, and um, 
Anyway, yeah, it's a misconception. And, of course, uh, until fairly recently, most educated historians were men, and for some reason they were not interested in female druids. They weren't interested in the evidence. But it's out there, and you can find it. And that's, I mean, I've done it for you if you want to find it, but I do talk about that in the book. It's a big misconception because the Druids were a class. They were a caste or caste um, equivalent to the Brahmins in India. And you were born into the caste and you could be born in as a female or born in as a male. And you were trained by your parents unless you went to Druid college, but that's a whole other story. Uh, but, um, yeah, they they were hereditary uh, intellectuals and religious leaders and specialists in arts like healing, you know, music, history, philosophy, um, genealogy. Uh, there's just many different arts that they were involved in, but, but uh, it was a hereditary class. Do you think that that's why in the modern era, Druids are still on, on the fringes of the, the pagan pathway as it were ellen because that preconception is still so ingrained in people that i know when you you mentioned the article you wrote several years ago one of the big things that people said to you about why they didn't become a druid was well all druids are men but as mm -hmm. you know anybody with a real interest in history and mythology and especially in the celtic regions will know that that's simply not true in it it seems to be one of these things that people just presume things and think well that's just how it is. I can't be a druid. But that's it's just so wrong. And it's I suppose it's very frustrating that even in this more enlightened era where we have more access to people who wish to investigate alternative lifestyles or, or reconnect with nature, that even still, Ellen, we've still got these incorrect perceptions that simply aren't true. Well, it's just as silly as the idea that a witch is an ugly old woman. Mm. That's an that's another stereotype. If you th if I mean dictionaries, we had a project about 20 years ago called the Dictionary Project, where a group of us got together, and we wrote to all the dictionary companies um, in the United States, the the big ones that we could find, and only one responded. But we said to them, you know, your definition of which is absolutely wrong, because if you looked up which in the dictionary, it said an ugly old woman, an evil woman, a hag. Mm. That was that was the definition. But there are probably just as well, there's probably slightly more women witches than men witches. But again, that's because people think witches are women. <laughs> so yes. in these more women are attracted to witchcraft. But a lot of men are witches and always have been. In fact, I have a book. <laughs> it's called The Real Witches of New England, <laughs> um, where I I, I talk about the history of the persecutions, and then I talk about uh, I talk to descendants of the Salem witches, the ones that were hung in Salem, and then I talk to modern witches. So one third of the book is all interviews with modern witches, and at least half, if not more, are men. Mm. And that yeah, it's the same kind of uh, just misconception. I suppose looking at your career as well, Alan, one of the things that I was I was intrigued about was that you became a, a druid in 1984, which for many of us is taking us back to a, a great period of our lives, I think. And and yet you seem to very quickly become very frustrated with the parameters of of what druidry was there because you were in the organisation known as the ADF, and then. You, you mm -hmm. kind of you kind of decided, <laughs> along with a couple of other people, that you wished to sort of push the boundaries a bit more. And, and was, was that because things seemed to be very old fashioned in that regard, Ellen? Or did you just think that it needed a, a fresher approach and more dynamic attack of the particular subject? Because obviously, from that point, you've you, you've traveled the world at your own expense, investigating mm -hmm. and researching things and meeting like minded people. Well, <laughs> uh, I, looking back on my life, which I think I can do now because I'm in my 70s, um, <laughs> and uh, I've, I've always been an iconoclast, <laughs> 
but I, I, I mean, I have a master's degree. I'm, I'm an intellectual, which is, you know, very druidic. <laughs> That's what a real druid is. Um, and um, every time I joined an organization, I would happily learn what they had to offer. And then I, I would very quickly see that there were limitations, you know, and that kept that happened to me over and over and over again. Um, but with ADF, uh, the limitation was that they were prescribing Indo-European Druidism, which is technically correct because the Celts and the Druids, of course, were Indo-European. Um, but they had they told people, oh, you can be a Russian druid you can be a polish druid um you know whatever and that's absolutely not correct you know and i knew that i i had read enough to know that you know the celts had a very specific uh culture and you know the celtic culture went from the west coast of france to the black sea but Scandinavia was not Celtic. The Latin areas, you know, around the Mediterranean were not Celtic. Uh, so you couldn't claim to be a Roman Druid, you know, that kind of thing. So it it, it seemed kind of silly to me. Um, so a group of us got together and we were sitting around the fire at a pagan gathering. And we said, hey, we we know that the Druids were Celtic. So let's start a Celtic Druid order, (laughs) which at the time was absolutely unique. It's hard to believe, but that was a unique idea that, gee, let's have a Celtic Druid order. So we started the Henge (laughs) of Keltria. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so that went on for a while. And then I grew dissatisfied there because the founders, I mean, I was one of the founders, but the, some of the other founders were uh, trained as Wiccans because most people were trained as Wiccans. I never was, which is really, it's been a, actually, if you look back on it, um, that's been a big influence. The fact that I was not trained as a Wiccan um, because people who are trained as Wiccans, which is a very modern religion, was invented in the 1930s by Gerald Gardner you know and uh, we we know that he invented it because we have six different versions of his book of shadows which means he was doing what everybody else does he was making it up as he went along and changing things as he went along but they were trained as wiccans so they couldn't see what they were doing that was wiccan they just couldn't see it because it was so ingrained but i not because I wasn't trained as a Wiccan, I could see what they were doing. I said, wait a minute, that's Wicca. That's not Celtic, you know. And so um, once again, I, you know, I I was there for 10 years and um, I was vice president for nine years, you know, and I trained a lot of people and traveled around speaking on behalf of the order uh, at my own expense, you know. But at a certain point, I just got fed up. Um, And then I got together with another group of people, and we created the Order of White Oak, which was what's called Celtic Reconstructionist, meaning that we, we, if we said something, we wanted to know that it came from the source literature. So we were looking primarily at 6th century, 7th century writings, and they were written by monks, so that's problematic. Things were probably changed. But on the other hand, this is something that I figured out, um, you could also rely on most of it because the monks had to know the actual stories. They had to know about the religion, the deities, the stories, the traditions, Um, in order to convert people because druids were the intellectuals of the tribes and if if a missionary was going to show up you know in a in a village and start missionizing um, they had to appear at least as knowledgeable as the local druids and so they had to know the laws they had to know the stories you know and so they wrote this stuff down um, and you know, shared it with each other so that they could learn all the all the ins and outs of the Celtic beliefs and religion and so on. Um, and we actually have, you know, for example, we know the how the bards were trained. We have an entire volume of year by year what the bards did when they were trained. Um, we have the bee laws, the laws pertaining to bees. 
and honey and beeswax, <laughs> and um, we have farming laws, and we have all that stuff written down. So it, it was wonderful that the monks wrote it down, but of course, for Druids, it's sad that they converted people, <laughs> you know, but they didn't convert everybody, of course, so that's good. <laughs> well, yes, and they've always, they've always had a very bad press, I think, like you say, because often the problem you've got here is that for most people, especially here in the UK, the Druids are especially connected to Anglesey in Wales, Ellen. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. a lot of people have an opinion about the Druid order based on the writings of the Roman. I think it was Tacitus who wrote the, yeah. about the, the conquest of Anglesey and it made all these spurious claims about them being disheveled and fanatical and mm -hmm. human sacrifices and blood being yeah. spilt everywhere and dancing with entrails in there and I'm, it's one of those things that the older i've got the, the less i've relied on certain ancient texts for information because especially when it comes to the romans they tended to say that about everybody they invaded well, Julius Caesar is also a big problem, and a lot of people look back to the Gallic Wars and they, they think of Julius Caesar as this faithful reporter. Yes. Um, but, <laughs> you know, for example, the Wicker Man, the whole Wicker Man thing, there's no evidence that there was ever a Wicker Man. I mean, people have glommed onto that like it's this wonderful pagan practice, you know, and the movies have been made about it, you know, but there's no evidence that that ever happened. And um, yes, people were sacrificed. We do know that. But um, we don't know exactly why. I mean, to this day, I mean, we found people in bogs, you know, that went through the triple death. They were conked on the back of the head, which is nice because they were unconscious. And then they were strangled and then they were stabbed or, you know, they had to die three different ways. Mm. Um, but you know, we, here in America, I don't think you do this in Britain, but here in America, we still execute criminals. And um, a lot of these uh, people that were killed, uh, they could have been um, war prisoners, you know, prisoners of war. They could have been criminals. Or there's another theory where the Druid, a very high level Druid, uh, would have offered themselves. Mm. Because at least one uh, case, there, the person sacrificed was obviously a druid because they had no wear and tear on their hands. They had very soft hands, so they didn't um, they didn't perform manual labor. So the assumption is that they would have been a druid. But the druid might have might have said, uh, you know, I'm going to offer myself because you know, hey, the Romans are coming or whatever the danger was, you know. Uh, in order to protect the tribe. So we we don't really know. There is evidence of, of human sacrifice, but it's not that much. It's not wholesale slaughter and burning of people, you know, that you just don't see that. Mm. And, and to be fair, I don't think the Romans should be casting aspersions on people's behavior in regards to how they deal with the criminals, since as as they used to put people to death for entertainment, Ellen. Of course. Well, that was the thing, is with Julius Caesar... He, his goal was he wanted to be Caesar, right? So he had to raise a lot of money uh, for his political campaigns and his military campaigns. He needed money. Um, so in order to get prestige, he had to conquer somebody. And uh, he had to make those people look so bad that the people in Rome would send him money. That's really what it was all about. So, you know, it political slander he had to make the celts sound bad and if you look at the romans of the bread and circuses like you like you just mentioned um he had to make the celts sound even more barbaric than that which is pretty hard to do i suppose as well one of the difficulties once you sort of start to to pull all this apart like you say because obviously the druids predate these early writings that you refer to there that the monks were writing here in the sixth and seventh centuries mm -hmm. we're basically they're one of those cultures i think that we don't know that much about we've got very skewed versions of it and and so it's also very interesting in that kind of aspect when it comes to the romans as well because obviously famously they never made it into scotland that's why we've got hadrian's wall because they were terrified of the the ferocity of of them north of the border and they also never made it to ireland which is quite remarkable right. when you think that right. they got to anglesey and you can see ireland from anglesey 
So that, that mm-hmm. it makes you wonder why they thought, oh, we don't want to go there. Well, it was that was the furthest uh, limit of the Roman Empire. That's mm-hmm. as far as they got. I mean, they had money troubles back in Rome. They were broke. Um, you know, they had a lot of problems. Uh, so they had to withdraw. That's what happened. If if they hadn't had problems in Rome, I'm sure they would have tried to keep going. You know, but it as luck would have it, they just that was the end. Mm. That was the, the northern fringe. <laughs> <laughs> Thank goodness. Yeah, very lucky for the Irish and the Scots. Right. <laughs> <laughs> when you look at the concept of, of a druid in this day and age, I, I would imagine, Ellen, that as we are in the midst of 2024, the world of the druid would seem to be more appealing to the to the younger generations these days as more people have become reconnected with the outside and nature and learning about things even down to sort of having a, your own little cottage garden where you grow your own herbs and, and the like ellen for somebody that's been so immersed in this for 40 years have you seen a a positive progression or do you still think that the druids are sidelined from the whole pagan boom that seems to be going on across the world at the minute well wicca is the number one most popular um religious pagan religious group um and most pagans will are wiccan whether they know it or not because (laughs) what they're doing they call on the goddess and the god they call in the four directions they dance around raise some power you know go have food (laughs) But most pagans are Wiccan, they don't, whether they know it or not. Um, and all the goddesses are one goddess, and all the gods are one god, all the standard Wiccan teaching, which has very little to do with the Celts or anything Druidic. Um, so, I, and, and TikTok, I'm not on TikTok, but a lot of people are uh, studying witchcraft and Druidism on TikTok now, which... <laughs> which I find sad um, because they're learning in these little one-minute, two-minute snippets, and they think they're getting trained, you know. Um, So that's basically what most of them are doing. Very few people are interested in really being a Druid because really being a Druid, uh, at least the way I understand it and um, the people that I'm with understand it, involves study. And we know that the ancient Druids uh, studied for 20 years, or at least that's what Julius Caesar reported, um, at least 20 years. Um, well, most of us went to school, uh, we, you know, for, so a lot of us have studied for 20 years, but we weren't studying Druidism for 20 years. So it does take quite a few years of study, it, which means reading books, not going on TikTok to learn, but... <laughs> Reading actual books, which is a different, that's a whole other thing. Kids that, kids today, <laughs> don't <laughs> they don't want to read books. And, um, I, I mean, I've had so many people object when they figured out, you know, that to be at least my kind of druid, they would actually have to read some books. They were horrified. <laughs> and I've actually had two people now tell me that, um, they can't read books, but what they recommend is that I read all the books, which at this point, I think there's 18 books that we have listed on. If you go to tribeoftheoak.org, uh, you'll see our basic book list. They said I should read all those books and turn them into videos, <laughs> and then they can watch the videos. <laughs> and they were serious. They yep. were serious. They thought I should spend 200 hours of my life making book videos for them so they don't have to read the books. I mean, <laughs> and they, they, and I was just flabbergasted. But I mean, what people don't realize, people who are addicted to phones, I don't have a smartphone, okay? And, and I refuse to get one. I have an old flip phone. But um, what happens when you're, and this even happens if you Google your information instead of reading a book or go online instead of reading a book or go on your phone, what happens is every 15 seconds or so, uh, something pops up 
I mean, there's an actual algorithm that does that. Like it'll say, hey, if you like this, go go here. Or why don't you buy these shoes or, you know, whatever it's doing. But it's like every 15 seconds. What that does is it stops you from thinking because you're starting to read something, you're starting to learn something, and then you get distracted immediately. And it cuts off your thinking. Whereas when you have a book, you can you can have a book on one subject or a couple of subjects, and you can spend an entire day or an entire week or an entire month, however long it takes you, meditating on that subject, thinking about it, drawing your own conclusions, you know, and your brain, exercising your brain without interruption. And that's what people don't realize is they're losing that by doing everything online. So usually when I give a talk like we're doing now, I always at the end say, put down your cell phone. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's step one. If you want to be a druid. <laughs> but, yeah, books are important. I suppose that, that that's kind of a criticism of this kind of takeaway culture that certain aspects have sprung up from where everybody wants everything explaining in 30 seconds, Ellen, and they just want a quick fix rather than, one of the key tenements of being a druid is the length of time it takes you to learn your practice to understand your place not only in what being a druid means to you but also how you react with your environment as well because one of the things i've always been really fascinated in is this concept of whilst often you will see certain cultures primarily native american and first nations people will prescribe wisdom to certain animals such as bears and wolves and eagles and the like that as far as i'm aware in in the druid culture this this wisdom and knowledge can also be prescribed to sort of trees and ancient stones and such like can it ellen and animals and birds yeah of course um any aspect of nature and once you learn how to fe it's feeling into nature once you learn how to do that you can do it with anything. You can do it with a river. You can do it with a fire. You can do it with a plant. You can do it with a tree. You can do it with an animal. Um, you can do it with a cloud. You can do it with a planet, with a star. <laughs> um, yeah, I, in the book, I actually have a whole chapter about how to do that, um, the three cauldrons meditation. But, uh, yeah, I like to say that Druidism is half nature worship and half scholarship. But you can't have one without the other. Yes. You know, you can't you practice you practice and intuition are two different things, you know. Yes, you follow your intuition, but first you have to learn the techniques. You know, and you practice the techniques and then you apply your intuition. So you need both. You mm. need experience and you need learning. Mm. And it's obviously seems to be a very conversational situation as well because not every practitioner is going to see things in the same way really are they Ellen they're going to view their place in the world slightly differently no doubt yes and there's many different kinds of druids as a result there are people who will you know read one book and say oh I'm a druid or hear a story about King Arthur and say I must be a druid or I love trees so I'm a druid <laughs> you yes. know you have you have that whole group which is probably the majority and uh, then you have the minority who are people like myself and the people that I surround myself with who like the old literature. And when we're doing something that's ancient, for example, this weekend, um, I've now been to two Lunasa rituals, but this weekend I personally led a Lunasa ritual um, here in my area for the public as a public ritual. Um, and it was just, they, it was for a bunch of Wiccans, <laughs> they're primarily Wiccans, right. so it was all new for them, you know, it was, but we did a good old, you know, hardcore druid ritual, I was in my robes and the whole thing, and uh, one of the things we did was we had a bardic competition, and people were complaining. They said, oh, no, we don't want to compete. We don't like to have to compete with people. And I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> this is traditional. You know, at Lunasa, there were poetry competitions. There were sports competitions. And, in fact, some people say, and I don't know how accurate it is, but they say that in Ireland, the Lunasa uh, competitions 
predated the Greek Olympics. Mm. And it, it actually, it does make some sense if you think about it, but they were structured the same way. They weren't held every year. They were held like every three years or something. And there were rules in Ireland during the gathering, during the competitions, no fighting was allowed. If anybody started fighting, they would be immediately, you know, arrested, expelled, whatever. Um, People, people, if they were in debt, um, and say say somebody was in debt and they had to take all their jewelry and pawn it somewhere, they were allowed for the duration of that gathering to take their jewelry back just so they could wear it so they wouldn't lose face, so they would look good, you know. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was just it, – and it was it, – so every care was taken – so that people would feel good, so that they would know that it was a, a, a gathering of peace, you know, no fighting allowed, <laughs> you know. Um, and in those days, you know, all the little tribes were stealing each other's cows and stealing <laughs> each other's women, and you know, but the, all that had to stop. You couldn't do that during the dirt. So it's exactly like the Olympics. And even the Greek Olympics had poetry competitions. And I wish we would bring that back. I'm going to start harping on this. But um, the the commercial modern Olympics, whatever they are, they need to bring back poetry competitions because that's that's part of the ancient tradition. But um, so anyway, we had this bardic competition and we had three classes of competition. We had one for visual arts which is arts and crafts. Mm -hmm. We had one for music, which included singing, uh, playing an instrument, um, and then we had a poetry competition. And we so we had we crowned three winners. Uh, we had little gold laurel wreaths for them, <laughs> and they all got they got chocolate. <laughs> you know, and, but it was great. And I was and but the thing for me, it was very meaningful for me, and I think it was meaningful for other people. Um, was when I told them, I said, "Look, th this is the ancient." You know, this is what was done in ancient Ireland at Lunasa, and it probably, possibly predates what was happening in Greece. So what we're doing now by honoring this tradition is we are now connected to the ancients. We're now connected to the way it was done 2,000 years ago. And for me, as a Celtic Reconstructionist, that's about as good as it gets, because I feel like I'm part of this deep, deep stream of, you know, tradition that's been going on for thousands of years. And that's what I try to do, which is very different from somebody who says, oh, I like trees and that makes me a druid. You know, it's a very different orientation. So th that's why we like finding out the old stuff. Mm. That's that's what turns us on, <laughs> you know, and keeping it alive and keeping it going, which is what I've done in all my books. Yeah, I think just about every book I've ever written, and I think there's 17 of them now, something like that. But um, it's all about keeping tradition going. Well, this is one of the aspects of it all as well, because I think often people focus on the magic and mystery of, of druids and they sort of overlook this celebration of, of art and music and performance, mm -hmm. which is clearly in the past. You can see it's there and the bards were, were held in great regard by their communities and the like. Mm -hmm. And it's it's interesting when you look at certain things like this, there are now having a resurgence in the modern era. Ellen, how it seems that people seem to chop bits off or or don't search enough. They go, oh, this was they get this package and they go, oh, well, this is what being a druid must really mean. And they've they've opened something from 1875. So it's probably worthless because it's been written by the Victorians mm -hmm. who, who've made most of it up, probably. And so to now get to the point where people such as yourself are going back to the, the source material, it's clear to see that this was what was part of the whole process of it because as with anything when you have a community of people learning different things people are going to be better at different aspects of what a druid is and therefore they would specialize in that particular concept would they not that's right yeah I, that's another misconception is that the druid was a wise man who knew everything <laughs> and that's i mean 
Yeah, they might have been wise, but I'm sure some of them weren't very wise because they were human. But um, but yes, they specialized. So, I mean, one might be a doctor or a Leah, it was called, um, you know, an, an, um, an herbalist who practices magic. <laughs> that would be the oldest definition of a doctor but um we have law we know the laws around being a doctor we, exactly how their house had to be set up they had to have a house that was set up so that a stream was running through the house so they would always have clean water running right through the house and um there had to be silence around the house you know if there were kids screaming or animals carrying on that couldn't you couldn't have that um, and, you know, there are laws about if the doctor didn't heal you, uh, the doctor could be sued, you know, things like that. Very, very strict laws. Um, but, yeah, that was one thing. And then you had historians, and uh, that was a whole different specialty. And you had ritualists, and you had lawyers. You had ambassadors. You had political advisors. You had sacred singers. Um, you had people that were experts in brewing and magicians and by the way a smith somebody who knew smithcraft was a magician mm. that was consi- that was magic that's why there are a lot of traditions and you probably know them in britain um there were t- still traditions about people getting married over the anvil yes in the forge yeah that's where that comes from because in the ancient times that was big magic to be a smith you know to take a rock and turn it into a sword oh my goodness magic <laughs> you know um, but um yeah they were specialists and um and, the th- and another interesting thing is that, as I mentioned, it's a caste. So if you were a Druid, born to Druid parents, you were automatically part of that caste. It was called Nemed, which was the sacred caste. Um, but the kings and queens were not part of the caste. They were warriors. They came from the warrior class, and that was because the king had to know how to cut off heads and protect the tribe. That was their big function. The druid was the one who knew the laws, and the king had to be the the wise warrior, the smart warrior. So kings were elected. Kings could also be fired, and this is long before the Magna Carta. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and, um, but the king had to be ritually elevated into the sacred class. And to this day, we just saw King Charles, for example, go through the coronation, right? Mm-hmm. He had to be ritually elevated by a bishop. Wasn't it a bishop? I think Mm -hmm. it was a bishop. Yeah. And in order to enter the sacred state, the bishop was in the sacred state, but the king had to be anointed and ritually elevated. Mm. And, And back in the day, it was exactly the same thing. The king, and we even have... And this is where it gets so interesting because we we have a part of a king-making ritual. Uh, There's a book called the Oidacht Morin, um, which you can read, where the the druid is telling the king, this is how to be a good king. Mm. And we have that, you know, just like we have a a book um, called called the Bek Brea, as I mentioned, the bee laws. Yes. You know, what to do what to do if your bees wander off into somebody else's yard and start sucking on their flowers, you know, who gets the honey? <laughs> yes. And, <laughs> and the, we have another book called the Yurikesh Narir, which is um, the laws of the poets, and it tells you year by year what the training was, how many ohms they had to learn in the first year, how many stories they had to memorize. How many in the second year? How many in the third year? When were you half trained? When were you fully trained? We have all this. So one of my pet peeves, the thing that really bugs me, and and I hate to say it, but you usually hear this from English druids. They they will say, or or people who were trained in an English-based uh, druid tradition, they will say, oh, we don't know anything about druids. Um, and so we can just make up whatever we want because we know nothing. You know, and it just drives me nuts because we know exactly (laughs) the bards were a type of druid, right? They Mm -hmm. were in the druid class and we know how they were trained and and so on and so forth. But (laughs) I'm on my high horse now. (laughs) That's all right, Ellen. We like it when somebody gets on my high horse. (laughs) 
quite <laughs> all right. I mean, I mean, I mean, I find that surprising because I think one of the one of the key artifacts that's been discovered in the in recent living memory, well, living at a push, because I think it was at the end of the nineteenth century, was this incredible cauldron that was discovered, Ellen. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, when, and when you look at it. It, it's it's jaw-droppingly beautiful. It, the art on it is amazing. It is beautifully decorated. And one of those wonderful things, it's fallen to a bog and it's been preserved for centuries. And we can we can get a real insight into into that kind of thing. And, and I know when you sort of mention it in your book, there's these really interesting parallels with Indian belief structures and the fact that their concepts seem very similar if not the same mm-hmm. in certain aspects. And we once again come to this question that certain historians over the years have told us that lots of people didn't travel anywhere until about 800 AD. And yet that's not true because we're finding artifacts all over the world from people mm-hmm. that shouldn't be in the places we're finding these artifacts. And this cauldron is certainly one of them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, there's uh, we're still studying it. I mean, just today I came across um, a post on Facebook of somebody, you know, writing about it again. But, yeah, there's always something that we're learning. Uh, it's just astounding. But there there is a figure that everybody thinks it's Kernunos, although there's no evidence that it's Kernunos, because we only know Kernunos from one uh, figure found in Paris. Um, and it doesn't even say Kernunos, it says Ernunos, starting with an E, mm. um, which we assume is Kernunos because Kern, horn, hard, you know, and the horned one, right? But Ernunos, uh, who could be Kernunos, was associated with merchants. And um, anyway, so they look at the cauldron and they say, oh, yeah, that's that horn figure, that's Kernunos. Uh, but we don't know that. Um, but the interesting thing is that horned figure on the cauldron is sitting in a half lotus position, holding a snake, and he's got a torque around his neck. So the torque tells us that he's Celtic, he's holding a serpent, and he's sitting in half lotus position. Well, lo and behold, uh, there's a very famous um, standard figure of Shiva, mm. who Sh- Shiva is often shown with a snake around his neck, Yes. not a torque, but a snake, which is supposed to indicate absolute fearlessness. And he's sitting in a, in a half lotus position, um, with, surrounded by animals. And the figure uh, on the cauldron is surrounded by animals. So either there was the same religion, that's what we would call Indo-European, either it was the same religious figure, uh, or it could have been just that somebody from India or trained in India um, traveled west and ended up somewhere in the west making metal objects after having been trained in india you know we don't know again i mean this is just endless the speculation that goes on about it it's fascinating really because i love this kind of history that we're all of a sudden beginning to pick apart whether it's who got who land which europeans landed in the americas or how have we got certain items in in africa that were only available in the americas and vice versa and you've got strange greek statues recently being discovered near pyramids in egypt in a pharaoh's burial ground you're like well hang on a minute why have we got greek statues in a pharaoh's burial ground that makes no sense as well oh in india they found images of corn and tobacco yes which which don't grow there (laughs) or didn't (laughs) right i mean people people got around a lot more than, than we think. I mean, for example, this whole idea that Columbus discovered America is just nonsense. Mm. It's nonsense. You know, the, the Scandinavians were here long before Columbus. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we even have Scandinavia, a Scandinavian village in Newfoundland yes. to prove it. We know this. And yet the popular mind still thinks in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue <laughs> and discovered America, which is total garbage. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah, it is. It is. And, and to be fair, you can't discover something if somebody lives there. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that's not my that's not my concept of the word discovery. 
Right. <laughs> he st- what happened was he got lost. Yes. <laughs> Looking for and India. Stu- <laughs> looking for India, and he accidentally washed up on a, on a beach uh, somewhere in the Americas, you know, in the Caribbean, mm. um, and and behaved very badly after that. Yes, that's that's putting it very politely, Alan. I suspect. Yes. <laughs> and, and th- one of the other fascinating aspects is the goddesses and gods that druids connect to once again this is often the, the the case when we look at these scenarios is that you may have a calling from a particular deity ellen you now does that negate the fact that someone who wishes to become a practicing druid can say well i want to focus my practice on a particular deity or does it work the other way around that you become the druid that whoever calls to you wants you to be? Well, obviously it can work either way, but Mm -hmm. what I usually tell students is just wait. One of them will call to you. Um, Don't, you know, don't use your, don't use just your intellect. In other words, to go searching for some, somebody, Um, because you might think in your mind that you, you want some powerful deity you know the morrigan is very popular yes. now with with women for some reason you know when i was when i was a girl it was bridget yes <laughs> which is a whole different energy you know but um rather than searching with your intellect for something just wait for it to happen and they will call to you they will let you know because there will be a deity that will absolutely fit you know that will answer all of your questions and and what you've been looking for, it will be there, you know. And you don't know. It could be a river goddess, um, you know, or a goddess of poetry or healing um, or a horned goddess or a horned god. I mean, you don't know. So just wait and let them talk to you. Um, and then that's that's a real druidic practice is – Depending on what your life path is, you know, if you're, uh, if you work with crafts and arts, you're going to gravitate towards a deity that is a specialist in those things. You know, if you're a healer, you're going to gravitate towards a deity that is a specialist in those things. You know, whatever, um, whatever works because the, the Celtic attitude, the real Celtic attitude for, towards religion and the gods is not uh, to to feel like you're a tiny little person and they're this big daddy or mommy in the sky, you know, it's <laughs> not like that. It's you identify a deity or they call you and then you strive your entire life to be just like them. That's the perspective. So a warrior would would honor a warrior deity and and try to develop a kinship with them by inviting them to the feast. You know, offering them food, um, putting out a plate on, on, on the holidays, putting out a special plate for their uh, their deity, um, you know, setting up a shrine or an altar to them, uh, saying prayers or talking to them, you know, lighting candles, you know, whatever, making offerings to fire, uh, whatever you have to do, offerings to water, depending on who it is, um, but yeah, you ha- you form a, a deep, deep relationship. Uh, it's what they ca- in yoga they call it ba- uh, bhakti yoga, where you have devotion to a particular deity. But they are not superior to you. Mm. You are striving to be just like them. Ah. That's the attitude. Mm. Mm. In regards to yourself, then, Ellen, who's your chosen deity, or, or which deity? chose you and showed you the path and is it similar to that kind of conception where you would have an altar and you would make offerings and if so is it a specific type of offering that has to be made to a specific deity well first of all the the deity is is bridget and she got a hold of me 40 years ago <laughs> and i'm not a smith i don't do smithcraft but i i i've been an herbalist for 40 50 years mm-hmm. and um and I've been writing books for all that time. So she's the goddess of poetry. 
Smith Craft and Healing. And she just grabbed me, and it was absolutely correct. She was the one. And so I have an altar to her. I have a wooden statue that somebody carved, hand-carved, wearing a green robe with uh, yellow Bridget crosses on it um, in in the living room. (laughs) I have this big – it's all centered around her. Um, I light candles there. Um, I used to be – well, I'm I'm a member of a group called uh, Ord Vrijedach, which is the Order of Bridget, um, I've been in, a member there for decades, and I used to t- uh, take part in a regular um, cycle of, of candle lighting. Uh, you know, we were divided up into groups, and each group uh, lights a candle, and then the next group uh, the next day, and then the next group the next day, and that's so that there's always candles being lit for her mm. because she's a fire goddess. Um, but I no longer um, adhere to a schedule like that because for a long time I would light a candle every single night. At in bulk, I would put candles outside. But uh, now it's more like when I feel called uh, to her because, again, you know, the, you try to be just like her, right? So she's not... She's not a mother figure. She's not somebody that I'm her little girl or something. You know, we're equals. But I I like candles to her. Um, I talk to her. I sing. I pray. I do all those things. Um, The books have been written because of her. Um, I have an invocation that I wrote in one of my books, uh, Druid's Herbal for the Sacred Earth Year. I have a a one-page invocation there. Um, There's another invocation in one of my novels. That to her and um, things come through. They literally come through me periodically, other prayers and, and invocations. But yeah, I suppose some people would be surprised that you have sacred days or, or holy days, which some people would say, oh, well, that sounds very much like being a pagan. But this is the thing. Why can't both? And yes, they are similar, but they're both very different as well, because they're not celebrated or symbolize exactly the same thing, depending on which side you're coming at these specific days, Ellen. And I think often, especially in this modern era, as you were saying about people learning how to be a druid in 30 seconds on TikTok, I think often you can get a lot of information that's pulled from all kinds of different sources that gets smished together. And then what comes out at the end doesn't really refer to anything. It's taken on board. It's kind of repopulated it and repurposed what the original meanings are. And therefore, the modern interpretation then just seems to be sort of a pick and mix approach. Yeah, well, that's what modern paganism is. It's mostly eclectic, but it's based in Wicca and very much based in Wicca um, with everything thrown in the kitchen sink. (laughs) (laughs) Um, That's paganism. and. You know, Druidism is part of paganism. Paganism is the overarching umbrella, you know, and within paganism, you have witchcraft, you have Druidism, um, you know, you have Egyptian religion, you have Greek religion, you have all kinds of traditions. Um, But like I said, the the average pagan these days is Wiccan, whether they know it or not. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you know, and and when I say Wiccan, I'm, I'm, I mean that very loosely because there is such a thing as traditional English Wicca, which is a discipline, which the average, you know, generic pagan has no clue about. People think paganism means you can do whatever you want, rip your clothes off, go run around, you know, sleep with different people. That's all pagan, right? Um, but that... No, no society, no ancient society would have lasted five minutes uh, if everybody ran around behaving like that. Yeah, that sounds more akin to a certain some of the certain cults that have sprung up in the last 30 or 40 years more than anything to do with pagans and druids, Ellen. Well, unless you're Dionysian, you know, but, but but that was but that was a specific time and place. They didn't run around Greece all day, 24 hours a day with their clothes off, you know, having orgies. You know, you can't do that. Um, They had very specific times and places where they they could behave like that. But they didn't have in their head, oh, I can do whatever I want all the time. You know, do what you will. 
uh, as long as it harms no, none, uh, do what you would. That's nonsense. You know, no ancient society would have ever said that. And if you study the Celtic laws, if you take the time to actually study the Brehon laws, every aspect of the society was very carefully thought out. You know, the laws of um, injury, how much money you owed or compensation you owed for injury or the different kinds of marriage or, you know, everything, every detail of life was carefully thought out. And there were consequences if you if you blew it. Yes, obviously. I think one of the aspects that intrigues me as well is that there is also this connection with Beltane where people feel that that's when it's one of those dates where the veil is thinnest whereas most people would say well that's halloween that's 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 the end of the year the Halloween. that's when that yeah. occurs whereas i think some people would be surprised that exactly the same kind of philosophy applies to beltane but this one i i hadn't come across this before ellen where people could choose to sleep under either a, a an elder or a flowering apple tree to mm -hmm. make contact and but also apparently some people would go out of their way not to do that because they were too scared mm -hmm. right well you you still see that in ireland for example if you go to ireland now and you t start talking to people about the fairies yes they believe in the fairies i mean any irish person worth their salt believes in the fairies you know um, but they're terrified of them. And, you know, I've, I lately I've, I've begun to wonder, though, about that. I have a feeling that the church might have done that to them mm. Be, um, because they're called the good neighbors for a reason. You know, yes. you're supposed to you're supposed to call them the good, good neighbors so they don't get offended. But they really are the good neighbors. <laughs> you know, they live alongside us. Mm. They're right. They're here with us. They're not somewhere else they're here we just can't see them because they're in a different dimension than we are i mean some people can see them but you really have to be able to slow down to see them um i hear them i don't see them i've heard them i've heard them singing um and i've also heard them playing music which was interesting uh, but but i i don't see them some people hear them some people see them some people feel them but yeah and and a lot especially in ireland people are terrified of them and i think the church did that to them it is it is very strange when you look at certain scotland's the same that they've got this attitude towards the good folk where they are basically it's like a an invisible horror story for a lot of the, the, and, yeah. and essentially the, the worst thing you could ever do is offend them which which is common across all sort of cultures that talk about little folk that as long as you're good to them they're good to you and, and never the twain should should cause each other problems because if you do you, you you're not going to win that particular battle and yet it, it's even with all because obviously both scotland and ireland were mostly catholic as well whilst england and wales became protestant it's surprising that with their reputations to get rid of any kind of other religious culture that was knocking around how in ireland and scotland the belief in the good folk continued it was almost as if they went hand in hand that six days out of seven people were good catholics and then on the on a particular day that's when they made their peace with the good folk ellen well it's really interesting if you travel in ireland for any amount of time uh, you know, there's an old saying, you scratch the surface of an Irish, a good Irish Catholic and you find a pagan. <laughs> the, yes. the, the Irish Catholicism, <laughs> yeah, it's just a thin veneer yes. because, uh, I mean, you go to a holy well and mm. those holy wells have been holy wells for thousands of years. They've only lately been changed into Christian wells before that they weren't good old pagan wells, you know, but you stand there at the holy well dedicated to Saint so-and-so, and then the person will tell you, oh, and then on one day a year, a magical trout will appear in the water. You know, a magical trout, <laughs> you know, it's like, um, yeah, I mean, they're just, the paganism is right there. It's right under the surface. Or if somebody threatens to cut down a fairy tree, everybody will get all upset. Or if somebody's trying to put a road through a, a fairy tree you know people get really upset it's it's all still there it certainly is and i think and i've said this before ellen i was very much before 
I started this show five and a half years ago, I was very much of the philosophy that anything to do with the Fae was all superstition and folklore. And I am nowhere near that position anymore. Mm -hmm. And have yeah. you, because I've, I've spoken to people that have a real belief in the good folk. I've spoken to people whose honesty and integrity I have no reason to doubt, who have had experiences with them, who have had encounters with them, both inside mm -hmm. their own homes and in the general countryside, and not necessarily just in Ireland or Scotland as well, Ellen. And so I think when we consider ourselves open-minded, often we're only open-minded to a certain point. And I think when you begin to unpick all this, like you say, and you dig beneath the surface or the, the presentation that we're often seeing in the modern world, it's still there. And you've just got to ask the right questions and maybe buy them enough drinks. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I've, I've had experiences here in the States. Um, you know, one time... I, for 30 years, I, I ran groves where people came to my house, druid groves, and each grove lasted about 10 years. Mm. And they came ev every month for 10 years, they came here. And in the summer, they camped out in the yard. And um, one of the groves, we had somebody who was a harper. He played the harp, which was incredible because we would go out in the woods. I happened to live in the woods, but we would go deep into the forest with the harp. And he would play the harp, and we would sing. Um, and then one day, we were out there, and he was playing the harp. And uh, when we were done singing and playing the harp, he stopped, and the music kept going. Wow! And we all we all heard it. Everybody, and there were I, there must have been almost ten of us, and we everybody heard it. Um, it, it wasn't just me, but they were obviously playing along. They were playing with us. And, you know, when we stopped, they just kept going. That was one time. And then another time I was in an old growth forest, not far from here, a place that had never been logged. And um, I was with a Native American elder and I was doing a vision quest. And very quickly, I mean, I'm talking about an, maybe an hour into it. I was not starving. You know, it was like an hour into it. Um, I had stated my intention going into the vision quest. I said what I wanted was to, to contact the fairies. I wanted to communicate with them. That was my goal. Hmm. And l very quickly, I set up my circle with uh, tobacco ties. And anyway, I was just in my tent, and very quickly I heard them. And I heard them singing, and they were singing in this gorgeous language that I couldn't understand. So I don't know whether they were singing in some Native American language or whether it was Gaelic or what it was, but it was this three-part harmony absolutely razor sharp three-part harmony and it just went on and on and it was incredible mm. it was so i i realized pretty quickly that i can hear them but i don't see them well i suppose you should be careful what you wish for helen sometimes yeah <laughs> well i think if i saw one and maybe they know this but if i saw one i might faint <laughs> i'd probably be terrified <laughs> I'd pass out. But hearing hearing them is okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm intrigued by the bit later in the book where you, you start to talk about people pulling together their magical toolbox, as it were. And you say that the first magical tool that anybody needs is a crane bag. Mm -hmm. What on earth does that mean to anybody who's unaware of a crane bag and, and its power in the druid world? Well, it's... Um... Some cultures would call it a power bundle. It's just a, a personal tool. Um, I mean, I give instructions for how to make it, you know. But um, you find earth from very significant places and put it in there, and you find sacred plants and parts of sacred animals, uh, feathers, fur maybe, but you don't kill anything, you know. You, you take it from the animal or you barter for it. You don't buy it. Mm. Anyway, so so the it's a shamanic tool and it's something that you can wear um attached to your belt. Uh you can wear it in ritual, for example. And it it just it it's a personal power bundle, really. I suppose does it depend on your particular pathway that you've chosen what you would put in there? Because I know you can sort of decorate it with symbols that mean things to yourself as well. Yeah, I mean it's it's your personal 
power bundle. It's it's to bring you power, you know, your personal power. Um, so, yeah, it's going to be different for everybody, what they put in there. But, I mean, I give <laughs> I give very detailed instructions uh, in the book Celtic Druidry. Um, but uh, the idea is to find five sacred things because there's five. The number five si- signifies completion. So it's the four directions plus the center. Mm-hmm. And so five plants, five animal parts, five earth from five directions, you know, like that. But But each person, you know. You, you pick a significant place, like it could be where you were born or where something important happened, you know, or the furthest north you ever got or the furthest, furthest south you ever got. Or You just, you have to de- decide where that earth is going to come from. Mm. And, uh, and yeah, and it's, it's your, it's you. It's like your power, your, your energy, um, it it helps you in your life you know when when you're facing difficulty or uh if you're if you're working towards being a a priest or priestess you know and you need to em- empower yourself to work with groups or whatever you're trying to do it's your power source your power bundle mm. well i suppose i mean the thing sometimes about presenting a book such as this when you are giving people a guide how to start uh, when you're giving people a guide on how to start in the world of the druid Ellen, I suppose some people would say, oh, well, we already know that. But I think that the great thing about books such as this is that there's no presumption that the person coming into it or picking your book up for the very first time has done anything or is even into paganism or Wicca or whatever. They may have just seen it and thought, oh, this looks this looks really interesting. I want to start. And I think it's testament to the passion that you have for being a druid that you have created a book that is so easily accessible to someone who could come into this who knows next to nothing about how to become a druid or even what the druids were well one of the reviewers uh the midwest journal of book reviews or something i forget who it was but any apparently it's an important reviewer because all the libraries uh read these reviews but in their review of the book they said this is suitable for the college audience (laughs) (laughs) so in other words it's it's suitable for college courses which I thought was fascinating. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I have a lot of archaeology in there, a lot of uh, ancient deities, you know, and and, and all through the book I, I tell people where to go if they want to learn more. Um, you know, I don't pretend that I'm the ultimate source of anything. Mm. Uh, but, um, yeah, it, it's... Uh, it's an introduction, but it also uh, keeps you going. So if you want to learn more mm. about any aspect, it's it's there. Absolutely. You've got to tease them in first, Ellen. And then mm-hmm. next thing they know, they're creating their own rituals and uh, and away they go. Well, that's the hope. <laughs> <laughs> Again, it's Well, it's all about, as I said, it's about plugging into the genuine ancient practices, the genuine ancient traditions, not things that were made up last week mm. or in the 1930s, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and and keeping those things alive, keeping those things going for the future. I suppose, is there there anything that wise Ellen, looking back, could tell younger Ellen when she started on this path back in 1984? Would there be any particular druid advice that you would give her? Or do you think that your journey has gone the way it's always been intended to once you decided to follow the druid path, Ellen? Well, I sure wish I'd had a book like that when I started out. (laughs) (laughs) It, w- it would have saved me a lot of drama, yes, <laughs> and then of... I could have had a a nice career as an accountant or something. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but you'd have been empty on the inside, Ellen. Yeah, yeah, but you know, druidism pays so well. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's a fair point, as as with any practitioner of, of these particular pathways. I, I, I take that on board. Perhaps you could... Well, there you are then. There's the next thing, druid accountancy. Uh, we need more druid accountants. <laughs> <laughs> 
we need more human accountants first, I think, Ellen, before mm. we before we start to train them up a bit more. Um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, going forwards as well, because you, you, you're so immersed in this. Like you say, you're a mentor to new initiates. You share your knowledge. You've been involved in this particular field for so long. Are you proud of of what the term druid means in the modern world or do you think it's still undergoing a a revival and it's it's only just the journey is only just beginning in regards to bringing druidry back into the modern era with the correct information for people to to dive into and take on board i think we've barely begun i don't think the world thinks about druids i mean uh, i mean the, people are somewhat aware of witches especially at halloween you mm-hmm. know they think about witches but most people don't think about witches but nobody thinks about druids the good thing about that is that most people are not scared of druids the way they're scared of witches you know and um I, they're partly scared of witches because witches are, they think that they're female. Mm. I really think that's it. They're scared. And men especially are terrified of women for some reason. And the, and if a woman becomes a witch, that's even more terrifying because now she's a woman who can actually take care of herself and defend herself, you know, like, yes. oh my God, you know. But <laughs> but they don't know what to think of a druid. Um <laughs> Other than it's a, an, a, you know, a helpless old man with a beard who's tottering around in the forest talking to to birds, <laughs> and <laughs> it's not go- not going to hurt you or something like that. I don't know what they think, but. <laughs> <laughs> So what's next for you, Ellen? What what does your what does the remainder of your normal year look like going forwards as you head towards other festivals and and the the end of the normal how how the world sees the year? But obviously in regards to Georgia, I believe your calendar resets on a, a Halloween and then goes forward again, does it not? Right. Um, it's a lunar calendar. The Celts had a lunar calendar. That's something else that's been forgotten. Um, they didn't celebrate on the first of the month. That's a myth. Mm -hmm. Uh, It was brought in by the Romans. The Romans celebrated on the first of the month because the first of the month was sacred to the goddess Juno, and you were supposed to make offerings to Juno on the first of the month. So everybody thinks that, you know, Beltane is May 1st, Lusa is August 1st, you know. That's not what was a lunar calendar. So Halloween, which is the next big one, Samhain, coming up, is at the dark of the moon. So at the dark of the moon, that's when the spirits are really abroad. Um, That's the next big one coming up. And um, I'm sure I'll be doing something. I just don't know yet where. Uh, As I said, I just finished doing Lunasa, so I'm still in recovery. (laughs) But um, there's always something going on. Uh, Another thing is the moons. um, I belong to a group called New Moon in the Valley, and um it's not a druid group it's it's an eclectic group and we're we're celebrating the moons and that's nice so there's always a moon coming up mm. so i honor those um when's the next one i'm looking at the calendar the next full moon is i think on the 19th of august mm. so i'm sure we'll be doing something university of massachusetts has a gorgeous stone circle with large really big stones um Almost not as big as anything at Avebury, but so, you know, getting to be on that scale. I mean, it's huge. And that's where we do the moons, and that's where we do a lot of our uh, big rituals now, uh, which is very nice. Um, and, I, and I'm doing a lot of online things. I have a museum in Connecticut, Stanley Whitman House. I've done a lot of talks for them. Um, I'm constantly, well, I'm talking to you. <laughs> I'm doing doing a lot of podcasts these days, uh, you know, almost every week, uh, at least one, sometimes more than one a week. And I recently stepped down. I should mention my Druid group. It's called Tribe of the Oak. I recently stepped down as the Arch Druid there, and we're, in fact, right now, this week, we're in the midst of an election to find a new arch druid, and um, it's a group that I founded in 2014, which has been led by women, even though you know we have men 
Um, we have men and women. But what's interesting is uh, the election that's coming up now, the candidates, there's two candidates, they're both men, and we've never been led by men. So it's going to be interesting to see what that's like. But uh, that by the end of the week, we should have a new arch druid. And um, if any of what I, all my babbling sounds interesting to anybody, um, you can go to... <laughs> tribeoftheoak.org if you want to learn Celtic Reconstructionist Druidism and um, it's very Irish oriented but very based in the old teachings, the old literature Um, we're steeped in the old stories, the wisdom tales, the wisdom poetry, you know I mean I had the experience, I've been to Ireland three times I think now, I I lose track because Mm -hmm. (laughs) I've been to Scotland twice, um England, of course, and, you know, other places. But um, when I first went to Ireland, which was, I think, 1990, Mm. um, there were no Druids. I mean, I I went to a pagan gathering. Um, There was one Druid there. And, and you know, I was speaking. And he immediately, you know, attached himself to me. And and, uh, we communicated for years after that. But, you know, there just weren't any Druids. And everybody was Wiccan. Mm. And and boy, did I get in trouble because I mentioned that I was on the stage talking, you know, and I, and I was looking at the audience and I said, you know, <laughs> um, most of you are Wiccan. And Wicca was invented by an Englishman named Gerald Gardner in the 1930s. You have a perfectly valid, beautiful path called Druidism. <laughs> Oh my God! I almost was murdered <laughs> because all these the Wiccan priestesses. How dare you! They got really upset. You know, they surrounded me and they said, "How dare you? Wicca is the old religion." <laughs> you know, because that's what they had been told. They'd mm-hmm. been told that that was their old religion. And I, you know, I I was just trying to tell them, "Hey, look, you have your own tradition." You know, <laughs> so now. What's really nice is there are all these, uh, since then, there have been these Druid schools that have popped up in Ireland, and um, now there's a lot of Druids. Hmm. And in fact, uh, the head of the largest British or English Druid order, Obad, is now an Irish woman, which is incredible, yeah. Amor Burke. Yeah. Um, so, so, yeah, the, and she knows the stories. You know, the old tales and the old traditions. She knows all that stuff. So it's things have really changed. I've really seen it change. Yeah. Let's hope they don't go to the Museum of Witchcraft in Edinburgh then, because there's a big display that tells you exactly when Wicca started. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> tells you exactly well, <laughs> exactly what you've just said and who was, who was yeah. involved and how they did it and where it all came from. Because I've been to the Aquarius Bookshop in London. Ellen, which is where the first meeting started for the well, for the wicker. So you know that's there's no getting away from it. It's it's a cast iron fact. So I'm very surprised that uh, they they didn't take that on board because that that's a matter of fact. Whether you want to believe it or not, it's true. <laughs> well, that was that was 1990. Remember, mm. Mm. I mean, I honestly I felt like I was a druid missionary. Yes. In Ireland. <laughs> That's how I felt. I was a Druid missionary to the Irish. <laughs> you know? and, um, and now things have things have come full circle. You know, the Irish are finally, you know, the at Ishna, the wonderful Beltane Fire Festival yes. is, is back. Yeah. I mean, that was something that went on for thousands of years and then stopped because it was, you know, the, the church put a stop to all this stuff. And that's finally back. Um, the you know the, the the traditions are coming back, and it, it's wonderful. But when I first went to Ireland, it wasn't like that at all, you know. So my, I don't know if my missionizing had <laughs> had anything to do with it, but anyway, I'm very glad to see it. Absolutely. Well, Ellen, it's been lovely to get some insight in both your latest book and your career, which has been shared with us with wonderful humor and and deep insight. Where can everybody follow your work, keep up to date with it, and get hold of not only this book, but some of your previous volumes as well? Well, I do have a website, which is about to be overhauled. It it badly needs it, but it's just elleneverthopman.com. So if you go there, you'll see all my books. And 
if people order books from me, they get a signed copy. Now, I usually tell people, to, and I know you're not supposed to do this, but I usually tell people to go to Amazon or <laughs> or to, you can go to Simon & Schuster or to Amazon or to your local bookstore because I've tried shipping books abroad mm. and it's horribly expensive. Yes. And if I try to ship books to, say, Australia, for example, which I've done, it took 40 days for a book to get there, which was crazy, you know, <laughs> and I, it's just, it's just not worth it because the person is, they've paid an arm and a leg for the book and the, it takes 40 days to arrive. And they're, they're emailing me every day saying, did you mail the book? Where's the book? You know, it's just not worth it to me. So if you live in the States and you're hearing this talk, feel free to order from me. But if you live anywhere else, you're better off just going to Amazon. But if you go to Simon & Schuster, um, you'll see most of my books. If you go to Amazon, you'll see all of my books because I, I have an author page on Amazon. And you'll see everything there. Fabulous. Well, I'll put links to both your website and I haven't decided which bookseller I'll, I'll promote for you there, Ellen. But uh, we'll, we'll mm -hmm. probably give them the one where they can get hold of everything for you. And I just want to say... Thank you so much for your time today, for fitting me in and having the patience and courtesy to take me on a tour of some of the aspects of Druidry with me and my audience. And I hope I get the opportunity to speak with you again. It's been a fascinating time. Yes, it was fun. Thank you very much. 